Okay, welcome back to Financial Clarity for Doctors, everyone. This is Rochelle Vanderzanden here with Corey Janoff. Hello. And today we wanted to talk a little bit about the state of the U.S. economy, because I feel like there is a lot of doom and gloom out there. A lot of news articles about things that are going wrong and how people are feeling about the economy and how it's doing. And I think the perception is often far from what the reality is. So today we're going to talk quite a bit about how the U.S. economy is actually doing and why there may be some bias and how people are perceiving that and also just how that's portrayed in the media, because I think that's a big part of the problem sometimes. So in general, I think there's some important things to note, which is like most people are doing pretty well. <laughs> corporate, corporate profit margins are actually high. They're at an all time high right now. So companies are making money. People are doing OK. And apparently the U.S. is also now leading the world in oil producing, which I don't I don't know if that's necessarily like a, a good or a bad thing, but it, it's definitely different from the perception. You know, like we expect that we are importing lots of energy all the time, that, you know, everything's more expensive, that we're making less money, we feel more poor, the stock market's doing terrible, and none of those things are true. So we're going to walk through a few different things there. Yeah, it's uh, perception versus reality. Polls are not always the most reliable source. Um, yeah, if, it, it, it's the like the customer is always right. Well, not always. You know, sometimes the customer doesn't mm -hmm. know what they want. Type of thing. Like, what was it? Steve Jobs, who was who said, had something relating to that, uh, or, or or no, it was Henry Ford who uh, who you know said if it was up to the customer, they would have wanted faster horses, not a not a car. So, um, but anyways, yeah, the, looking at some polls. So 2024 Gallup poll that was recently released on economic sentiment, only 17% of Americans rate their personal financial situation as poor. So, which means 83% of Americans feel like they're doing okay or even better than okay. Um, then a similar uh, poll from uh, Axios and, and the Harris group found that, um, 63% of Americans rate their current financial situation as either good or very good. So most Americans are actually doing pretty well and are and admittedly doing pretty well. 62% um, of Americans say they have enough money to live comfortably. Yet in the same Gallup poll, only 27% of Americans consider the current U.S. economic conditions as excellent or good. And 45% consider the economic conditions as poor, and 63% say the economy is getting worse. And then in that Axios Harris poll, 71% of Americans describe the US economy as not so good or poor, and 51% say it's getting worse. So the majority of people are doing pretty well. The majority <laughs> of people think most of America isn't doing pretty well, and it's only getting worse. So um, and you can see this, I think, throughout history and across the board, like there's an, a similar um, uh, poll that's done on on the sentiment around uh, K through 12 education in America. And the consensus is the U.S. education system is in trouble. You know, we're, we're getting worse and worse. Um, schools, you know, underfunded, aren't educating our kids, et cetera. But when asked about how people feel about their own child's education, the sentiment is largely positive. So a poll from 2023, Gallup poll, 36% of Americans are satisfied with the overall K through 12 education system in the United States. Yet 76% of Americans are satisfied with their own child's education. So how's that possible? Three quarters of people <laughs> feel their kid is getting a good education, but two thirds of people you know, only a third of people think that the U.S. education as a whole is good. So, you know, I'm doing OK. My kid's getting educated, but everyone else is uh, is in trouble. So it doesn't quite line up the perception with the reality. It's so true. I think that it's really common to see that. And it's partially just this information bias where, you know, you have your personal lived experience and you know what that is and you can make, you know, pretty reasonable assessments of your own current financial situation, but all of the, the inputs that you're getting from the outside world on the state of everything in general is much different. So 
So yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting that we can't see past that sometimes. When we're talking about the economy, inflation tends to be the number one issue. When we look at these polls, people say that inflation is their top concern right now because they're paying more at the grocery store and things like that. Yet, according to the Congressional Budget, budget Office, <laughs> I can't speak, but Budget Office, people's incomes have risen faster than inflation since 2019 and across all income levels. Like People are getting paid more also, which is why inflation has become partially an issue. And I think it's it's harder to see that because these changes are not linear. It's not like your income increases at a linear pace and inflation increases at a linear pace. So sometimes it catches our attention in a different way. But collectively, we spend a smaller percentage of our incomes on household necessities in 2023 versus 2019. And I think it's partially the inflation was you know, negligible if not maybe a little bit of deflation during COVID, but people still had extra income in the form of like stimulus and things like that. There were lots of people that experienced some temporary unemployment, but then people were able to go back to work very quickly and there weren't enough workers out there. So people got paid fairly well to do the jobs. And so your income is also increasing. And then as that started to happen, then inflation started to take off. But those two things are very linked. And so in reality, we're not necessarily paying a lot more as our, a portion of our income, even if we are paying more. Yeah, I think it's worth reemphasizing that. Yes, prices have risen. That's inflation. Things are going to be more expensive a year from now than they are today, as long as there's inflation. Even if inflation is like a fraction of a percent, it still means prices will be higher tomorrow, a fraction of a percent higher than they are today. Prices aren't coming down. But our incomes, and this is across all income levels, you know, broken down into um what 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 is a, a fifth uh, quin, quin quintiles? Is that mm -hmm. one a twenty percent <laughs> bracket? So the lowest twenty percent, the highest twenty percent, the middle twenty percent, you know, across all income brackets, our incomes have risen faster than uh, our spending on household essential goods. So people have more money in their pockets at the end of the day after accounting for things like food, utilities, et cetera. So yes, prices are up, but people's incomes are also up more. And as long as people's incomes are rising and people have jobs, they're going to spend money. That's just how our consumeristic society works. If we have money, we're going to spend it. And that's <laughs> going to drive up prices. If we have more money to spend, we can, we can afford more expensive things, or we can afford to spend more on the same things. And basic econ 101 supply and demand the sellers are going to meet the buyers at the highest price point they can uh to maximize their their total revenues and profits so you know if they can raise prices and we're willing to pay for them then more power to the sellers for uh for for being able <laughs> to make more money um from us who are willing to spend more money on it you know people complain about higher prices yet Airlines are booked, hotels are booked, cruises, vacation spots, Airbnb, like people are still spending the money. They might complain about it, but there's until they stop spending the money, you're going to see these prices continue to increase, hopefully at a reasonable rate every year. You know, historically, inflation's average at about 1% or excuse me, about 3% per year. It, it ebbs and flows. Um, but, uh, you know, from one year to the next, hopefully we don't notice it too much. It's just we saw a pretty rapid pace for a couple of years there during the pandemic wow. that it, it makes it more apparent when you know prices are up as quickly as they as they rose but our incomes are up too right. yep i think it was like inflation was so 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 minimal for like a second and then in order to make up for it it was like a couple of years worth of inflation all at once so it felt it felt a little unusual that's for sure um, I think our biases also affect this. So part of it is like our political biases that always feeds into how we perceive things. And then on top of that, it's also the media we consume. So whether we're reading media or we just see it on like our social media, whether we are listening to NPR or whatever it is that we listen to in the radio or, you know, you're watching news, which I feel like fewer and fewer people do nowadays. Late night talk show hosts, like that's also a source of news for people nowadays, but all of them have some sort of bias ingrained. I think the, the political bias is important just to note, but right now, like Biden is the president and Democrats have a considerably more optimistic view of the economy than Republicans. 
which is normal. So if your person's in office, you're going to have a little bit of a rosier view than if your person isn't in the office. So a Pew Research poll said that 44% of Democrats consider the U.S. economy in excellent or good condition compared to only 13% of Republicans. When Trump was president, Republicans had a considerably more optimistic view and Democrats were pessimistic. Makes sense. We have like all of these biases that are built in because of our perceptions of who is doing a good job or not doing a good job. The other thing is that, you know, the U.S. economy has generally been in pretty great condition since 2009. Like coming out of the big housing bubble and everything like that, like things have been on a great path. And obviously, again, it's not linear, but it has been a pretty steady increase in the stock market and wages and all of those kinds of things. Um, when we think about media consumption, I think the biggest thing to keep in mind is not necessarily a political bias, but it's more of a financial bias. All of these news institutions that are out there are out there to make money. It used to be that the news was treated as a public service and it was separate from like making money at a network, but that's just not the case anymore. It's now a business driven by money. And what they put on the news is basically what will get them viewers so they can sell more advertisements, period. So whoever their audience is, it's very much like, how are we going to drive viewership? How are we going to increase viewership and make money? <laughs> and that's not by telling the feel good stories. You know, we, we tune in more for negative, scary, concerning, fear inducing stories. Who knows why that is like psych psychologically, like, why are we driven by that? Why do we want to hear that? I don't know, but it's very, very true. Steve Hartman of CBS News does the heartwarming stories about goodness and people. And Corey mentioned that he had seen an interview where he's tried to get his stories to lead the news. Like, I want to start with this. This is great. Like, let's start on a good note rather than being towards the end. But execs have told him that people just tune out if we lead with the positive stories. If that's what's on first, they're going to be like, oh, let's go find something more interesting. <laughs> and then they tune into the gloom and doom instead. So people say you want, they want positivity. And I think this is true for me too. But really the things that draw you are the things that have more conflict. Like that's that's what we see in, in movies and stuff too. There's a reason that every kid's movie starts with a parent dying. Like what the heck? Like that's <laughs> like we have to create some sort of drama. And if you think about it, when you watch kids' movies, it's like at least half of them, one of their parents is dead. Like, what is that all about? <laughs> But apparently that's what we want in our lives. <laughs> yeah, we vote with our wallets and with the clicker in terms of the TV channel. And, um, and yeah, we say we want positivity. I mean, in that interview, Steve Hartman, who I'm sure you've seen some of his stuff, he, he, he and they're on YouTube and everything. But um, and, you know, you, it's, all the networks, you watch ESPN College Game Day, they always have some heartwarming story about someone who overcame an obstacle and is now starring for their college football team, um, et cetera. But there are sometimes it's a sad one, but um, we say we want the feel good, positive stories, but our actions speak. Otherwise we, we vote with our clicker. And when the news leads with catastrophe, explosion, criminal chase, you know, beware, there's a manhunt in your neighborhood, tornado destroying your neighborhood, um, or your friend's neighborhood, you know, like negative, 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 concern, concern, concern. And maybe I'm just speculating here, but it, you know, the, it probably has something on the psychological level to do with just our innate makeup. You know, we got to be weary of the lion hiding in the bushes and, and, and run from fear things that are going to concern us. So our, our senses are heightened when there's concerning things out there, whereas when everything's hunky dory, we don't have to worry as much so we can go do something more enjoyable than and tune out <laughs> and watch the news. But I mean, you know, we got to have endless examples. They do an excellent job of, of tugging and capturing our attention by inducing concern, anger, et cetera. You know, if we're on the inflation theme, the lead story on the nightly news might be, you know, is your grocery bill larger than it used to be? You're not alone. And then they cut to an interview with, you know, this elderly couple, Jack and Diane, um, who, who live on a fixed income of, of $1,800 a month, you know, 1400 comes from social security disability and 400 from a, a small pension. And 
you know, Diane says, we used to, you know, buy Cheerios, but now I have to get the store brand Kroger's and because the Cheerios are too expensive and I've started measuring out my milk and, and you know, I take a quarter of a cup measuring cup to, to make sure no milk goes to waste in my cereal. And we, we've stopped eating bacon and eggs altogether because we just can't afford it anymore because of inflation, this darn inflation. And then they'll interview some guy in front of a grocery store, who, you know, rants about how he used to spend $50 a week on groceries. And now it costs darn near $80 a week to buy the same stuff. And, you know, it's always, you know, they're interviewing middle America or, you know, uh, people that are a little more impoverished because no one wants to hear a rich person complain that, you know, their landscaper is now charging $200 a month instead of 150 or their personal trainer up their prices like that. That's that's just going to create resentment among 90 percent of Americans. So, you know, it's always, you know, people who are struggling because that, again, tugs our emotional heartstrings more and gets us to tune in a little bit more. Then they'll cut back to the studio who, you know, is talking about voters being undecided in the election and inflation being the number one topic and and then go to some lady who they're interviewing who says, whoever has the most compelling plan to tackle inflation and bring prices down will get my vote. And, you know, it's rinse and repeat with the next story. Um, but uh yeah, it, 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 it gets our attention, gets us to tune in. We feel for the people that they're profiling. We're, we're captivated by by whatever is going on. And um, it, 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 it's they, they, they know how to, to make money from our eyeballs. And yep, simple as absolutely. that. Absolutely. That's their job. I mean, and, and like, we can be mad about it, but honestly, like all of these news networks and newspapers and things like that, if they don't have viewers or readers, they will go out of business period. Like that's how it's built now, unless we're talking about like publicly funded news sources, which are few and far between in the United States, at least. So, you know, it, it it's self-preservation. It's not necessarily malicious. And I think that's important to kind of understand. There are a few other things that catch our attention and, and make us feel like the economy is in worse shape than it is. I think layoffs are another one, maybe a little bit less so lately, but at least last year, there were quite a few high profile layoffs that caught attention, you know, with Google and like big companies, big like giants in the tech sector that we felt were very well insulated. But I think, you know, honestly, they just had a lot more employees than they maybe needed. So there were some layoffs last year. If you do a quick Google search, you're going to come up with more right now, even. And a lot of these companies sometimes rely on borrowing to, to grow and to maintain their employ and like their employment level and things like that. And when interest rates start to go up, that becomes a little bit more challenging. So they want to be a little leaner, which makes sense. But even though we've seen these high profile layoffs, in general, the labor market is very strong. We're going on 27 months of sub 4% unemployment as of when we're recording this in May. And that's from like just a whitehouse.gov article. And that's more than a 50 year record. So employment is, is not an issue. It, it may be in some sectors, like in tech, I think that there's definitely been quite a few layoffs, but in general, there's not enough workers still to fill all of the job openings that are available. Like if you get laid off, you can find a job. It may not be the exact job that you want. You may not get paid exactly what you were before, but there are jobs available and unemployment in general is very low right now. And you can find individual stories and circumstances that contradict the 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 data as a whole. And again, that's what the news does. They find where's the story because stories are a lot more captivating than data. Like none of you will remember any of these data points that we've shouted out today, um, but you will remember a story that you hear. So if, if you want to capture someone's attention or convince them or change their mind, tell a compelling story, which we could probably do a better job of on this podcast. Um, but it's those individual stories that resonate, not the data points. We're just, uh, you know, today trying to point out, hey, the data suggests otherwise. You might see or hear <laughs> a story that that shows, you know, negativity. Um, and yes, those those definitely exist, you know, with 4% unemployment, record low, but that means 4% of people are unemployed. And that's, you know, probably uh, millions. I mean, what's the total population? 320, 350 million people yeah, in America. Yeah, but it's like 4% of the active labor force. Yeah, so the active not, labor yeah. force might be half of that. So 150 mm -hmm. million people. Okay, 4%. That's like 
six million people that are looking for work um, that can't find a job. That's a lot and of people. Like eight million jobs. <laughs> yeah, and, and you feel for those people that aren't able to get the job that they want, and, and that's a lot of people. And it's true. sad, but you know, as a whole, we're doing pretty darn well. Um, and uh, and yes, you know, if you get laid off, you, there's a good chance you can find a job if you, you know, especially if you're willing to be flexible. Um, and the data suggests that you're probably going to make more in that next job than, than you're currently making. Cause the numbers keep moving up and to the right, at least as of late. Um, I think housing is, is, is one area that is challenging as a whole. You know, people are, are having a tough time finding affordable housing, getting into a home as a percentage of income. Housing is basically at an all time high for both renters and purchasers, but you know, for a lot of you listening to this, many of you already own your homes. And if you have a 3% mortgage rate on your house, your mortgage payment as a percentage of your income is arguably you know, at an all-time low historically. It's just current prices for new buyers and people seeking new housing is, is extremely challenging. Um, but it's a relatively small percentage of the population that is in that boat. Um, and, you know, I don't have a solution imminently unless the government starts, you know, subsidizing builders to develop more housing projects. You know, we're probably going to see you know, some, some challenges in the housing market, price-wise at least, for, for a while until the baby boomers start dying off. And, uh, you know, not to, like, <laughs> <laughs> no sense sugarcoating it, you know, we got about a decade to go and then there's going to be a, a trickle down of, of supply increase as 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 those homes start getting vacated so yeah i think it'll be interesting to see how population trajectories change this because there's a lot of trajectories that sort of show the like our population peaking towards the end of the century which is scary in a lot of ways for other reasons but it's interesting i do think that when we're looking at interest rates for housing there's a lot of recency bias, like people expect interest rates to be low and want them to be low because they were up until, you know, a year or two ago. But those like 3% interest rate loans are much more of an outlier in terms of what is an average interest rate than the current interest rate environment. Like 7% is way closer to average than 3%. So it, it will probably come back down a little bit, but it's going to come back down slowly. So I think that that, that is a problem like just the affordability of housing. And I think it'll take a little while to correct it. Yeah. Hard to predict interest rates and uh, timing of, of things. So just like it's impossible to predict the stock market from a day to day or week to week basis. But for those of you that are stuck on the inflation piece, I've got some bad news for you. Prices are not coming down um, unless we experience deflation, which rarely occurs throughout history. Um, so Inflation, and most of you probably already know this, but inflation is the rate at which things increase in price over the course of one year. So if inflation is at 2%, a $50 item last year will cost $51 this year. That's a 2% increase. Uh, inflation can decrease, yet prices are still increasing. So a decrease in inflation simply means the rate at which prices are growing is slowing down. So we are currently experiencing decreasing inflation. We were at like, what, 9% a, a couple of mm -hmm. years ago. Now we're in the 3% range, depending on which data point you look at, because there's more than one measuring stick for inflation. But we're between 3 and 4%. Um, and, and we're moving in that downward direction. But just like if you're driving your car and you reduce your speed, you're still moving forward just at a slower pace. Same with inflation. You know, inflation can come down, but you're, it's still going, prices are still moving up just at a slower rate than they previously were moving. So as long as people have a job and are making money and are seeing their incomes increase, people are going to spend that money and there's going to be inflation. Um, the Fed can do all they want to try and control it, tamper it, it's, uh, temper it, et cetera. But as long as people have money to spend, they're going to spend it and, and you're going to see prices increase, hopefully at a digestible, modest rate, but it, it, it will persist and it will be there. Um, and, and as we noted earlier, people over the last five years 
where most people are looking at with this inflation, you know, pre-pandemic versus today, uh, people's incomes as on on average as a whole have increased faster than inflation over the last five years. So yes, inflation prices are up, but your ability to spend money is also up. It's actually up more than prices. And across all income quintiles or quartiles or however you want to slice it up, you know, the, the, <laughs> the lowest, uh, and I think probably the most um, beneficial thing for this economy is the lower income quintile along with the highest income quintile, but the lower income quintile has seen the biggest wage gains on a percentage basis and spending power increase on a percentage basis um, than, than, than any of the, the demographics. And that's huge, you know, because they have the, the most need for more money. You know, we can afford to spend more on necessities, goods and services, and maybe a little bit of fun discretionary spending as well. That's really going to drive the, uh, you know, the, the economy is, is people who, who need to spend that money, you know, rich people just hoarding their money. If you're not spending it, you're just saving it and investing it. That's not gonna, you know, help the economy. Um, you know, it's good for your balance sheet, for your savings rate, ability to achieve financial independence, but it's, it's not moving the needle on, on economics. So, so I think, yeah, it, it's, it is, uh, that's an often glossed over piece of this current economy is as low wage earners have seen some of the greatest increases historically in, in modern times. Yeah. I think it, I don't know if this is true, but it, this is again, my perception and who knows, but I think that the housing costs have affected them the most also though, just because true. with people yeah, not being able to get into a home rentals increasing, I think that that's probably been really challenging for that group of folks. There's a lot of other data points that we can look at that you may or may not remember, as Corey mentioned earlier. <laughs> but I think these are kind of some important things to think about. In the 1950s, people spent over 20% of their income on food. In the 1970s, it was about 15%. And today, it's under 10% on average. So our incomes have risen faster than the cost of most necessities, which is why people spend more money today on services like cleaning and landscaping and food delivery all of those kinds of things and more money on travel and leisure. We have the extra money to spend when we're not necessarily spending the money on necessities. Um, also, aside from like a very brief period during the pandemic, which we talked about briefly, unemployment has been below 4% for much of the last handful of years. And prior to now, the last time unemployment was below 4% outside of just a couple of months in the year 2000 was in the 1960s. So like unemployment is in a very good spot right now. Um, I think the labor participation rate is really interesting as well. For people that are age 25 to 55, the majority of working age people, it's currently at 83.5%. And it, it's never been above 85%. It doesn't didn't cross above 80% until the 1980s, partially because we saw a lot more women entering the labor market at that point. And then before that, it was like below 70% until the mid 60s. So more women are working, people who want to work can get work, at least 96% of them, if we're excluding those 4% that are unemployed and looking for work. So that we're, we're still in a good spot and more people are working, which is great. Yeah, if you want a job, for the most part, you can get a job. Um, we have mm -hmm. a very strong labor force participation rate, which is fantastic for the economy. Corporate profit margins are, are basically at an all-time high. They're hovering around 10% after taxes, and the historical average is closer to 6 or 7%. We've seen a big spike in recent years. So, you know, companies- Is that partially are, taxes, Corey? What's that? Is that partially taxes? Well, I think that's 10% net profits after taxes. Right. So, so what's your question? So, tax rates are lower. That helps. That um, maybe, yeah. So yeah. corporate tax yeah. rates are down a little bit. That probably does help to some degree. But yeah, right. so companies are really good at, at making money, which is great for you as an investor in those companies. You know, and this is just data for publicly traded companies because you don't have data on private companies on what their profit margins are because they don't have to release that information. Um, even though like something like what is it? 87% of, of companies out there, um, you know, or people or workers are employed by privately held companies, but it's something like 50% of the profits in America are from 
the S&P 500 mm-hmm. companies. Yeah. It's something yeah. insane. But yeah, basically corporate profits are about 40 to 60% higher than the historical average. So if you're an investor in those companies, uh, that's a good thing for you. Um, we already mentioned the US is, is now the world's leading oil producer, which who would have guessed 20 years ago? I mean, I think the perception is still we rely on the Middle East for oil. And anytime you see news about OPEC trying to fix prices or whatever, it, it doesn't affect us nearly as much as it used to because we produce our own oil uh, largely. Um, household incomes like have risen. The median uh, household income in 2022 dollars in the year 2022, the latest census was about 75,000. Um, in the year 2000, the median household income was 67,000. And again, today dollars in 1984, it was 57,000. And you keep going back through history. So af- adjusted for inflation, our incomes have risen, which again, we spend a smaller percentage on household staples like food and groceries and more on uh, unnecessary but convenient services and travel and leisure and fun. We've got, we just have more money to spend than we used to. And yeah, the housing cost is a big issue as of late, last few years, um, really since 2022, when interest rates spiked from 3% to 7% for mortgages. Uh, that's made it tough for for home buyers and rents have come up as well. Um, but but aside from that, yeah, again, people are still finding ways to spend money. And even with housing price increases, it's not tampering spending. People are still spending money. Um, you know, the, the numbers are moving up and to the right. So it's, again, the, the sentiment versus reality. People believe and feel that housing is a huge issue and a big concern, which it is, but the data suggests it's maybe not that big of a concern. Uh, Again, the majority of homeowners either have their mortgage paid off in full. So mortgage rates don't affect them at all. And, and, and most mortgages are, are held by people who purchased or refinanced you know, prior to 2022, and they're sitting on a 3% mortgage. So it doesn't impact them really either. Um, now, if mortgages stay in the 7% range for the foreseeable future, you know, fast forward a decade, they're still at this rate. Um, then yeah, more and more people as they move and change homes, and then you're going to see a larger percentage of mortgages that are, are a bit higher and probably people spending a larger percentage of their percentage of their income on housing. But at least as of now, it hasn't impacted the economy as a whole too much, but time will tell um, what could happen in the future. Yep. I think in summary, despite what the news says and kind of coaxes us to believe on a regular basis, Americans as a whole are doing pretty well. It's not like I'm fine. And if you look around at, oh, everyone else must not be doing fine, even though I'm fine. Like, don't don't let that affect you just because the news seems to indicate that. But we can absolutely find examples of compelling stories about people and communities who aren't doing fine. So there's always going to be some situations. It's not going to be universally across the board. Everyone's doing well. That's just not how the world works, unfortunately. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be concerned about people that that are struggling. Like, we can still be concerned about them and still acknowledge and understand that as a whole, the economy is doing pretty well. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, there, in some ways it's never been better. I think there's always room for improvement anytime you look at a situation. The emotional state of the country, on the other hand, <laughs> I mean, I think, I guess we could always improve there. <laughs> I think we always have biases that we're looking at and struggling with as a, as a human society, I think that that's, that's always going to be a problem, especially when the the world is just so big now, you know, there's so many people that our perceptions are not based on like a small community. It's like these very, very large communities. And, and at that point, it's very easy for those, those perceptions to become skewed. So in general, just focus on the things that matter to you, the things that you can control. And if you can't control it, try not to worry about it too much. If it doesn't matter to you, don't worry about it. If it does matter to you, obviously there's some things that you can do about it. Like if it's something you value, you can put your money where your mouth is and make some charitable contributions, whatever it is that that you feel like you can do that's helpful if there are things that are concerning to you. Yeah, news is no longer localized. It used to be back in the olden times, what's happening in my immediate community and vicinity around me? 
because that's where, you know, your economy was, you know, you bought from the local grocer, the local suppliers, um, you, you helped your neighbors out. If there was a, a weather storm in, that affected your neighborhood, that was huge, but you know, it didn't, you weren't, didn't really pay attention to the next town over the next state over, et cetera. But now with the, uh, evolution of the internet, it's, again, they, they want our eyeballs. So it's not about your local community anymore. What's the story globally that can capture your attention? And you best believe there's going to be a story somewhere in the world that is jaw dropping and, and outlandish. You know, there's a war, civil unrest, genocide, natural disaster, you name it, you can find it uh, with, with the internet and, and global reach these days. And that's, what's going to lead the news. And it's, you know, you, you think things are doing worse than they probably actually are. Um, and for those people that they're highlighting, yes, they're doing terrible. Um, but for the, the economy as a whole, we're, we're, we're doing pretty well. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, try not to fret too much over what's happening in the world around you or what, the news is telling you is happening in the world around you because it might not really be that uh, big of a deal. Just focus on the things that matter to you and what you can control, um, which is challenging. There's a lot of things out of our control and it's hard to just brush those aside. But if if you can try to, to not stress over that um, and only focus on what you can control that actually matters in your life, that's probably the, the best advice we can give you. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for listening, everyone. See you next time.